Yes. Um, Mr. Murray, I've got a handful of questions um, from core participants for you. Um, could we go, please, to your witness statement, Shamik, it's WITN 3076002. Four pages from the end. Next page, please. Thank you. If we go to the paragraph at the bottom of the page. So, Mr. Murray, I've been asked to ask you whether um, there was any ring fencing of the funds transferred to the Terence Higgins Trust. And I think you answer that here in paragraph 131 of your statement. You say, six lines from the bottom, a restriction was placed on the funds, that's the funds transferred to Terence Higgins Trust, so that they can only be used to support haemophiliacs who were infected with HIV as a result of contaminated NHS blood products, their spouses, partners, and dependents. First of all, is, is that correct? That's your understanding. Yes, it's my understanding that we've basically used our, our own trust deed as the parameters for that restriction. Um, in relation to the that bit of it, the £27,000 of it that was honeycomb, um, yeah. uh, from the honeycomb fund, was any particular restriction placed upon that 27000 for it to be used for widows, or did it simply go into the overall pot and subject to the overall restriction? Uh, there wasn't any particular restrict, uh, any restriction to that. It went in the overall pot, but there was a, a feeling that the restriction we placed would include that within its parameters. Um, we can take the statement down. Thank you. Uh, um, I, I've asked you in the course of the afternoon how um, um, uh, the McFarlane Trust during your time there ensured representation or participation from the wider registrant community. And, and I think... Um, uh, um, your principal answer, um, not your sole answer, but your principal answer has been by reference to the board's user trustees. Mm -hmm. Without, please, identifying any trustee um, by, by, by name, um, were um, um, there any trustees, um, uh, user trustees from the bereaved community as opposed to primary beneficiaries? Uh, not to the best of my knowledge. And so was there any means by which the views and interests of the bereaved community were sought or communicated to the board? Not directly through the board process, but these were, you know, the staff team should have been in contact with the bereaved community as well uh, and should have been able to bring matters to the board. Um, next question is about the transfer of data um, from the McFarlane Trust to the Skipton Fund at the, when the McFarlane Trust was, was uh, closing down. Um, can you assist with what consent was sought from beneficiaries in respect to the transfer of their data? Um, whatever was legally deemed as necessary. I mean, the tr that was done uh, because of the need to uh, keep data open for the ability of the inquiry, first and foremost. Uh, it was done in, in discussion with the inquiry and in discussion with lawyers. Um, so I'm afraid I don't know whether explicit consent, uh, it may well have been that there was an explicit consent needed for that. So I, I could say we, we do have written statements from, I think, um, Ms Barlow's successor, um, 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 which may um, assist in answering that question. Uh, the interim um, CEO worked incredibly hard around this difficult issue to try and make sure that it was done in a way that was uh, protected data security, but also enabled the inquiry to do its work. Um, given uh, the difficulties experienced um, from time to time, or perhaps all the time, in, in securing um, the required levels of funding from the Department of Health, was any consideration ever given to your knowledge to uh, attempting to um, liaise directly with or approach directly the Treasury? No, it wasn't. Uh, it was always communicated through the Department of Health. Um, uh, can I yes. just make an aside? Uh, I, I have to say that would be unlikely to receive any uh, particular benefit as it was Department of Health money and, you know, the Treasury would only have allocated the whole budget to Department of Health. 
Um, in, in, on the issue of loans, I think you told us earlier that there had been um, um, some loans or, um, uh, uh, written off during your time before the winding up of the McFarlane Trust. Um, and then I asked you why, why the final loans were not written off, and, and you said it was because it was regarded as being unfair. Why was it fair to write off some loans at an earlier stage, but not write off the outstanding loans at the end? I think uh, some loans were written off because uh, there were mistakes made uh, in their execution, uh, and some loans were written off because they weren't secured on, on property or secured in any way, and therefore there was no expectation they could be uh, ever repaid. I don't know whether you can assist... Uh, sorry. Uh, but just as a reminder, that many loans, as my understanding, were repaid. I don't know whether you can assist with the next question I must ask you, but I'm going to ask it in any event and see. Um, how many people were registered with the McFarlane Trust when it closed? I think it was about, well, primary beneficiaries, I think it was about 300. Um, I'm afraid I don't know what the, the wider community who had access funds uh, were and whether they are defined as registered or not. Um, and then can we look please at MACF five zeros two seven underscore one one nine. This is a report from the Chief Executive, so from Ms Barlow to the Board of Trustees, 30th of October 2017. We look at the fourth paragraph, it's about the Reserve Grants Programme. It says this, at the current time the paperwork is written as if intended only for beneficiaries infected in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, as they have transferred to the new respective schemes from the 1st of November 2017. However, it's possible that we need to open up applications to those infected in Scotland as well, even though they transferred to the new Scottish scheme on the 1st of April, as the reserves were built up during the years when it was a UK-wide scheme. I'm currently taking legal advice on this. If we do need to allow applications from those infected in Scotland, it's anticipated it will be more difficult for these individuals to demonstrate charitable need, as the level of payments they receive under the new Scottish scheme are considerably higher than those in the other three UK countries. Um, do you know how this was resolved? Was the scheme opened up to include Scottish beneficiaries? Uh, I'm afraid I, I can't remember, uh, and so there must be uh, legal advice on, on the outcome and some reference to it further on, but I can't remember it. Okay. Well, again, perhaps I can say for the benefit of um, uh, the, the, those core participants who have a particular interest in this, I think we'll be able to find the answer in the paperwork and, and we can hopefully communicate um, that answer to them. Um, more broadly relating to the, to the question of what was done with the reserves, You've said there wasn't enough time to run another grants programme or to consult. Um, w was any um, consideration given to asking the Department of Health to extend the timetable for the, w for the winding up of the McFarlane Trust in order to ensure that all avenues for distribution were properly examined? Uh, they weren't, uh, and I think the reason for that is we were under considerable pressure to close down, uh, and there was no expectation given that we could have possibly asked for that. Uh, the other fact is that by doing the transfer, that money is, is still alive and available, uh, and I believe that THD is, is open to discussion on, on how best to use it. Um, d during the period you were involved with the McFarlane Trust, um, do you know what, what, if any, work was undertaken with the Terence Higgins Trust? So, first of all, prior to the decision to transfer the money, as you'd referred to some previous involvement with yeah. the Terence Higgins Trust, was that still ongoing at the time you were at the Trust? I, I believe it was before I was at the Trust. I think there is a reference in our, our minutes to when that was, but I'm afraid I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, and then, um, um, as part of the decision to transfer the reserves, do you know what interactions um, or, 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 or took place between the Terence Higgins Trust and the McFarlane Trust in, in, in terms of the, the transfer? So, uh, principally, there was communication between the interim CEO and the Terence Higgins Trust CEO. Uh, the interim CEO re reported back to us, uh, and I think that is contained in uh, the sets of minutes at, in, at the autumn and winter of 18. Um, the next question is still about um, um, Terence Higgins Trust. Do you know whether widows 
were informed that they um, uh, could make claims on the fund of the funds of the Terence Higgins Trust? I don't know they were specifically informed, but also I'm not aware that they were you know, not informed, if you see what I mean. There, there was a, a letter written about the transfer, um, which uh, was done by the remaining staff, the interim CEO and director of operations. Uh, I, I can't say I know precisely what the mailing list was at. I imagine it was fairly wide. Was the possibility of transferring the reserves of the McFarlane Trust to the Haemophilia Society considered at any time? It was uh, mentioned briefly as one option. And why was it not pursued? Uh, there wasn't any enthusiasm within the board for, for that option. Was that because of the fallout between the two charities in, in the aftermath of the alleged libel by the Haemophilia Society's chief executive? I don't think that was specifically referenced, uh, but one would imagine that that would have some impact on people's views. I would also just note that there are at least two members of the board who had served as Haemophilia Society trustees and therefore had very good knowledge of the organisation. So those are the further questions I've been asked to ask. Do, do you have questions, sir? Well, just, just one, really. Um, and it follows from the questions you've just been asked uh, the, about the, uh, the transfer of funds uh, and your telling council that you didn't have very much time and therefore mm -hmm. didn't take steps which if you had had time you might have taken. It's not just, sorry, Go not on. just time, resource as well. Uh, as I think I said, you know, we were on skeleton staff uh, by this stage. That, so, that's, uh, that's what I was going to, to, to ask, just oh, to, to, be, to be clear. No, you, you've answered it in, in a sense. Um, the, the trust uh, as such, uh, was independent of government. Mm -hmm. So it couldn't be closed down as a formal act closing down the trust. That would, no, be, that would follow. Yeah. But the staff who were employed weren't employed by McFarlane at all, were they? They were, were they? transferred. When, the, uh, when uh, Caxton, who held the employment contracts, was closed, they were transferred over to McFarlane Trust. So the they did work staff. for McFarlane? At that point, yes. Uh, and who financed the uh, their employment? Obviously, so it would come out of McFarlane funds, but the funds, presumably, for their continued employment would come from the department. Yes, indeed. It was agreed with the Department of Health, uh, who initially, again, had hoped we could wrap up even quicker than we did. Um, but in reality, partly because of the, the lease, which was only due to expire in February 2019, after which we would have no premises, uh, but also the reality of shutting down five organisations is pretty complex and challenging, um, that we needed uh, more funding to cover that time, because the only alternative would be to use the reserves to, to do that final work. Uh, and is, is this the position uh, that you need, you, if you had had time, you would have had to effectively buy that time by paying the staff salaries in the meantime? Uh, absolutely. Um, so you could have you done know, it, but it would have come at a cost which the government, because they were the sole funder, wouldn't repay. Would that no, be right? The government, the government were clear that we needed to shut. Yes, I, I see. Well, I think you've answered the, the question which was in my mind as to why you didn't simply go on until you consulted uh, and decided what to do with the funds. The answer would presumably be that there would be less funds to give away because uh, they've been used up paying staff. Absolutely. Uh, was, Absolutely. It ever, was it ever rationalised in that way? Uh, to whom, sir? Well, uh, uh, internally. Uh, it, yes, I mean, it was understood that we had to move uh, really rather quickly, quicker than perhaps we would have liked. Um, uh, I, I would add again that I did say earlier that, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, there was a process put in place in 17 um, that could have been rewired to perhaps done a bit more earlier. Um, yes. But we were under intense pressure with limited staff to do an awful lot of things, not just for McFarlane, as I say, but the staff for other trusts as well. Yes, I see. Yes, that, that, that's, that's all that, that I ask. Thank you. Mr okay. Murray, is there anything that you wish to add? Uh, no, thank you. Well, can I, I thank you very much, uh, Mr Murray. You, you've filled in the, the gap, as it were, 
um, from the evidence that we've already had. Uh, we've had it covered in part by Ms Barlow, but not from the point of view of a, a chair of the um, McFarlane Trust. Uh, between the ending of uh, Mr Evans' term uh, and the transfer over uh, of assets uh, that remained to uh, the Terence Higgins Trust. Uh, can, I, can I thank you for that? Can I, I thank you also for your, your patience in bearing with us for a late start, uh, and it follows, uh, I'm afraid, a uh, rather later finish than you might have hoped for. So I hope it hasn't disrupted your, your evening too much. But um, thank you for that uh, and uh, for the information you've given us and, and your explanations uh, as we have gone along. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that was helpful, sir. Um, sir, tomorrow, 10 o'clock, we had the evidence of Susan Daniels. Yes, it's just uh, Ms Daniels tomorrow, is it, it is, not? It is, yes. Very well, 10 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you.